to introduce him in a moment. But before we do that, we wanted to make sure that Dale knows who's uh, in the room today, and you all know who each other's in the room, and the folks who are joining us on the phone. So let's start with the introductions of um, people in the room, and then we'll check in with um, who's on the phone. So Dan, can you start with you? Um, Dan Lesler uh, from Harvard. I'm Sharon Farmer from Sydney County. Then you're the Assistant at Navy Public Health Council. Uh, Rachel Glenn from Public Health. John Gilbar from Public Health Mobile Medical Facility. Stacey Kennedy from Valley Studies. Thanks, Karen Spalman with King County on Health, Chemical Abuse, and Dependency Services. Susan Blackland from the State of the Department of Community and Human Services. Darcy Jaffe from the Department of Community and Human Services. Sunshine Manastro from the National Community Health Services. Kara Johnson, Prevention Division of the Health Department. Uh, Shirley Hanley, the Community Psychiatric Center. Sinala Community Health oh. Services, Public Health. Anthony Hughes, Public Health. Carolyn Wilson, Health Services, Region 10. Janice X. Brown, with Asian Health and Health Service. Gretchen Bruce, Committee to End Homelessness. Doug Whalen, Natalie Ryan. David Johnson, Health Office. Beth Barber, International. Julie Martinez, Public Health. I'm John Feldman, Health Services. Isaiah Jarvis. And on the phone? Happy Origin City of Tacoma. Hi. Anyone else? Anyone else on the phone? Christine Brown, Coaching Ken. Hi, Christine. Hi. Corey McCaskey, Agent on the line. Anyone else on the phone? Okay. Great, thank you. I'm going to turn it over to Amina to introduce Dale and get us started. Okay, before I introduce Dale, I, I wanted to do my end. All right. A couple more people in there. Uh, I wanted to make another introduction. Susan McLaughlin introduced herself. Um, I wasn't quite sure how to introduce the role because she is newly appointed starting uh, September 12th. Susan's going to be our health integration manager reporting to Jackie McLean. So, and for those who don't know Susan, she's worked in our division as our child mental health assistant planner uh, and manager for 11 years. A um, couple other little uh, bookkeeping issues. Um, this, ses this session is being recorded um, and it's on live meeting and it can be, there will be a tape produced and you can go on and actually watch that at some future point, that, so I understand. Um, for those who are participating by live meeting, handouts can be found uh, in the handout icon that's in the upper right corner of your screen. And for those who are participating remotely, either by telephone or by live meeting, if you could put your microphone on mute, that would be very helpful to keep a lot of the background noise and feedback. So um, there's a lot going on with health care reform across the state of Washington. A number of different uh, communities have got uh, are doing together and, and planning, and it seemed like Dale was helping all of them uh, plan for uh, for this future. Uh, Dale is a national consultant. I've watched him on webinars uh, on several occasions. Uh, he's an expert about healthcare reform, not just in knowing what's going on in this region, but all across the country. So we're very fortunate to have someone who really has a finger on the pulse of what's going on nationally and uh, and unfortunate to have it as a local resource. So without further ado, it starts. There you are. <laughs> so you're gonna push the button my bad. Okay, so what I wanted to do today was um, do an abridged version of a presentation I gave to the healthcare cabinet a few months ago, so you can get a sense of the kind of um, way I'm trying to wrap my brain around how things are unfolding, and uh, and also to connect up with um, what I've been telling the folks at the state. So, because I don't think there's anybody here from the state, so. I can sort of make things up about what I said in that meeting and don't even know the difference. Um, just kidding. Uh, I've been working on projects in several states uh, 
uh, around the same question that you all are trying to grapple with. And, um, and I brought some lessons from what's happening in Central Oregon, Vermont, and Camden, New Jersey. And so I described uh, Central Oregon as where some of the design work has started on the West Coast. In Vermont and Camden is where some of the design work has started on the East Coast. It's a nice juxtaposition. And then um, thinking about what's happening in Eastern Washington and Southwest Washington, and then, and then talk, as I say here, um, there's some, a bunch of work I've been doing in California that I think is relevant. So the idea is what are the best and, and brightest ideas that we can shamelessly steal from other places around the country is not my modus operandi. And then the last thing I want to talk about is what's happening with um, some health foundations, a bunch of health foundations in the state of Washington that's relevant to this, this work that you're doing. Let's begin with the presentation to the state. And uh, I'm going to make a bunch of long pauses so that if you um, have questions or comments, just jump into one of those pauses. Because I think it would be much better if we have a discussion rather than just Dale talking at you for 45 minutes or however long the slides are. Um, described as it all started in Southwest Washington, this idea of, a, of a, what ought to, about this regional thing how to organize regionally. And, um, and what's interesting, when you look at all the cool stuff that's happening around the country, is we know how to fix the healthcare system. We know that medical homes, we know that accountable care organizations, we know that payment reform, this is like stuff that you've been reading about or working on or thinking about for a really long time. Oops. Well, um, and uh, so I must be pushing a button. Um, okay. Sure. And, um, and so there's the Dartmouth, Dartmouth Workings ACL Collaborative and the Premier Health Alliance that have been working on developing accountable care organizations and how to help, which are really homes for medical homes. And there's the Patients in a Primary Care Collaborative that's been working You know that is that um, there's no such thing as multitasking, and so um, how could you possibly engage in a meaningful conversation while there's all this great stuff going on? And um, the other thing is, has anyone seen the book uh, Presentation Zen? So, so if you if you ever did PowerPoint presentations, um, I really recommend that you you uh, look at the book Presentation Zen because. The other thing that it says in the book, that in, what it says in that book, is that human beings mostly cannot listen to someone talk and read text on a PowerPoint slide at the same time. You know what I'm talking about? It's literally impossible for most of us to do both. But what happens is when you see slides with lots of text, you um, it just gets like totally confusing and and it lowers the retention rates fairly dramatically. So having only a few words and lots of pictures is what I try and do. And, um, and so this has more words than probably actually is, is good for a good learning experience. But anyways, there's this group called the Patients Center Primary Care Collaborative that's been working on this great um, medical homework and like I said, Dartmouth Brookings and the Premier Health Alliance is an alliance of about 300 nonprofit hospitals around the country that are doing pretty cool work figuring out how to develop homes for medical homes so that these health homes or persons certain health homes or patients with medical homes are supported by specialty clinics, hospitals, in a risk-sharing arrangement where everybody's roaring in the same direction. So you don't have medical homes trying to keep people healthy. And the specialists 
in hospitals trying to keep their practices full on their beds full um, at the expense of, of medical homes doing what they need to do. So it's really important that we think more than just primary care clinics being the solution to everything. And one of the problems that I have is that all, much of this effort is happening for folks who have commercial insurance and who live in middle and upper middle class neighborhoods. And so I've been thinking a lot about how does this picture relate to folks in the safety net? And I think that the answer is different than how, how all this stuff works for folks who have insurance and, and good jobs and can pay their co-pays and deductibles and all that stuff. And so this is what I think about the picture of the, the train wreck when I think about folks in the safety net, uh, which is pretty much the space that I worked in for 30 some years. And if you think about the, the wonderful pie chart that says what are the social, the determinants of health, you know, there's behavior and environment and genetics and there's this little teeny pie slice called health care which is like 10% of the determinants of health. And so I say for folks in the safety net, good health care is really important but no way, no how is it enough to actually help people move towards health. And if you think about the triple aim of better health for the population, better care for individuals, um, and those are things helping us have reduced costs or reduced growth in costs, uh, it's really important to think more broadly than just medical care. So I think about this example is a very common one because there's such a high prevalence of folks who have diabetes and depression. And if a doc in a really fabulous medical home says, oh, you know what, um, I'm getting this new bonus arrangement for helping somebody manage their diabetes. And that doc ignores the person's depression. And you think about the kind of self-care that's required to help people with diabetes manage their, their diabetes. If you ignore the depression, there's no way someone's going to be able to manage their diabetes. So you talk to any primary care doc about somebody with a comorbid condition of diabetes and depression, and, and can you really help someone manage their diabetes without helping them manage their depression? No. But, but then you go, okay, well, this is, take this mom and add on a few more things. She's the head of a household. She has two kids. They're not doing very well in school. She's lost her job. She's on the brink of homelessness. She's experiencing domestic violence. And if you sit down with a bunch of community providers, they'll go, oh, Dale, this is one of my easy cases. You know, I've got another 12 things I could add on for my harder cases. And the reality is, is you have to think, well, it's, it's actually about the next slide, which is the work that the public health folks have done and the CDC has done around the social determinants of health. And it's really quite simple that if you live in, in a poor community where you have all the you know, education problems, violence, low income, poverty, et cetera, um, people in that community have lower health status, poorer health, health outcomes, higher health costs. And it's not just because they're not getting um, the best possible medical care is that the social determinants of health are basically crushing them. And if you don't help that mom and her family deal with the other things going on, there's no way she's going to be able to manage her diabetes or depression. So, so this is, if you haven't seen the Poverty Clinic article in, in the New Yorker, um, it's such a beautiful piece around what happens to families and, and this uh, woman named Burke got a hold of her, the psychologist who was working in the clinic. She turned around to the ACE study, the Average Childhood Experiences study, and it's, it's really important to sort of think about somebody who's committed to working with this population but not knowing about the overlay of Adverse Childhood Experiences on the life of the young moms that are coming into her clinic who have all these chronic health conditions that she just did. Be, she feels like she has her finger in the dike, and, and that's really what we're talking about. And so the most wonderful medical homes and accountable care organizations that don't sink their teeth into the stuff are going to fail. It's just very clear and simple in my mind if they're working with anybody that's, that's living in this, living or part of the safety net. And so one of the places that I'm going uh, 
relatively soon, I'm going to do a site visit here at the Fulton, in Fulton County, which is inner city of Atlanta. And there's this organization called the Neighborhood Union Primary Care Partnership. And what they, the county executive in this county came into office and he, based, and he looked around at all of the funding streams and said, oh my gosh, you know, we have the most complicated set of si funding silos. How can we possibly help our citizens move for, towards health, especially the folks in the, in the uh, safety net? And so he basically has been working with his team to, um, to try and dismantle those silos. But rather than starting at the top of the org chart and spending like days and years and months of, uh, of reorganizing, you know, the boxes on the org chart, they're starting at the service delivery level in communities. And so this primary care partnership is the first one that's rolled out. There's five, you can go online and you can track it, you can look at what they're doing. There's five projects that they're working on. And this idea of one-step shopping is not new to folks in King County. What, see, what I keep thinking is there's a lot of stuff that I've been learning about that's happening in bits and pieces in this community, and there's some very nationally leading um, experiments, if you will, on how to address the needs of folks in the safety net. And I think for this group, your job, one of your jobs, is to organize all that stuff into a cohesive framework that is that the normal tech, you know, taxpayer who doesn't deal with this kind of stuff on a daily basis. You can sit down and you could have a 30 second elevator speech or a two minute speech or a 20 minute over lunch speech about how how helping folks in the safety net move towards health is critical for everybody that lives in this county. That kind of clarity of narrative, clarity of framework, clarity of design, I think is the next, is one of the next steps for you all. But look at, look at all the stuff that's under this one roof. This is more than an organization, and not only do they do a much more holistic view of what people need for health care, including rural health and behavioral health and WIC, and, but there's all these other stuff that are attacking the social determinants of health, employment assistance, foreclosure prevention, farmers market, community garden, a walking trail. So in my mind, the health Medical homes and health homes are transitional objects, a transitional model. They're not the future. The future is holistic health and wellness centers. They're customized to meet the needs of the neighborhoods that they're in. And so if you're in Broadmoor or you're in you know, Hunts Point or you're in Rainier Beach or you're in um, White Center, those, each one of those neighborhoods think well about what we need to customize for the for that holistic health and wellness center. And, and in every case, it's more than just good medical care. So, um, so how much of this? So is this like like the you know this is like stuff I've been thinking about for my whole career? Yeah, yeah. And what's interesting is if you sit down with people who don't work with the safety net, they go, oh, yeah, I'm out of there. <laughs> and, if, and, and this includes people that are heads of Medicaid authorities and states who m most of the time have, a, have their physicians and they have a medical background and they, they run a program that, that works with poor people, if you will, but but they, they're so medical centric that they haven't quite um, connected these dots. So I think that to tackle the things on the previous slides, you have to customize not only medical home, but you have to customize the accountable care organization. So an accountable care organization is a legal entity that's the organizing of the provider community that basically says, we're going to be um, getting paid in a way so that we're incentivized to help people move towards health. And all the, so generally what happens is a bunch of different organizations form a limited liability company. There's two models. They form a limited liability company and they get a payment from the payers and they basically get a bonus arrangement so that if they help the people that sign up with the help, help this, these health homes, if I sign up for my doctors in here, and this health home, and I'm basically, it's like the Verizon model. 
where I'm getting all this stuff as part of my signing up with this primary care provider. So the specialists and the hospitals that are working together are going to be helping me move towards health as well as making sure that I get lots of big expensive procedures that help these people get rich because they're still in a fee for service model. And in the safety net, you need to have the stuff. Social service agencies, employment, education, public health, housing, oral health, lung cancer, et cetera. These are the players of the safety net accountable kind of care organization. And I'm working on a bunch of projects where we're trying to build these safety net ACOs at the delivery system level to help people move towards as well. So, so Dale, you said that there were two basic models. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, sorry. Reliability. The second model is the integrated health system group health model. So if you think about group health, group health is already an ACO for middle class people because it has everybody who's doing this stuff are employees. Most of them are employees. There's, a few, there's some contractors in that have contracts like private therapists and so on. But most of the people are employees and they get a capitated payment from the, the purchasers and then their job is to help people move towards health and manage the population. But group health um, doesn't really have much connections to this stuff. And I was in a meeting with group health where they, a couple meetings where they said, you know, we don't really, if you want it, we'll be honest with you, we don't really know um, we're not that great at medical homes for poor people. And we're, we're trying to learn how to do that because we really realize that's one of our Achilles heels. And, um, and so they, that ACO, which is a staff model ACO, and, uh, and a limited liability company, which are a bunch of organizations that come together to be sort of like a group health light, while still remaining separate corporations are the two models. Thanks, Anne. I forgot to mention that piece. Any other questions or comments? Yes? So I, I have a quick question, which is, um, we're talking about the social determinants of health and the, the uh, M model, which I've mentioned that before. And we keep, you know, originally this was talked about as health homes, and we merged, you know, we talked about medical homes, and they're sort of used interchangeably. But I think, that, I think of them very differently. I think if we use the frame of a medical home, we're going to be continue to be bound by the medical model of care. And yet I hear presenters sometimes use them interchangeably as we have today. And so I wonder what your thoughts are about that as opposed to maintaining the integrity of the label health home because it is a more inclusive way of thinking about care and leaving medical home to the group health and Swedish folks to manage. Yeah. So, so this is... Um, you know, this is a big problem. The words are important, and if you look at what the definite, what the terms are in other places, there is um, there's about 20 different terms for this thing, and uh, and if you, if they have to actually do public opinion surveys, and um, asking people about these terms, and if and if you use the word medical home, and even and if you use the word health home, people think you're talking about nursing homes. That's one thing that happens, and people think you're talking about physical houses that somehow have medical people working in them. <laughs> and, uh, and so it's incredibly confusing. So there, I want to say a couple things about, um, about uh, your comment. The first is, um, I know how words are important, and, I, and I'm not sure what the right term is. And so I, I personally think holistic health and wellness centers are... Um, are really the right term, but when you go back east, I was like I was just in Detroit and I, I, I used that term and they just laughed at me and they said, oh, you're from the West Coast. Neighborhoods, is that a term that's being? Well, then health, see, I see the health care, health, I think health is better than health care neighborhood. And I think, the, for me, the health neighborhood is everything on this picture, which is different than this here. So it's, it's um, I'm like really, I would love if you could, I don't think health home is, is the end all be all term. But the other thing I want to say is there's a lot of people that I talk to who don't work in medical care who are very concerned that when uh, we start integrating and we try and leverage health care reform to help all of these folks do a better job working together and succeeding, 
if the medical model is going to infiltrate all of this stuff and basically bastardize or, or um, um, reduce what you do to, to the medical model. And, and, um, and so that's a really interesting question that's actually maybe even more important than what you call it. In, in my brain, I think that once you start creating payment incentives and payment models where docs get paid for helping their patients move towards health, as opposed to getting paid for volume, that you're going to, inf I'll pretend that none of your medical people just heard this sentence, so I don't have to keep making a really long sentence. None of you, you're going to infiltrate the medical community because they are going to realize once their bonuses are dependent on, on the, addressing the social determinants of health that using a medical model is like unbelievably inadequate for helping their patients move towards health. So there's all this cool cross-pollination that's going on where actually people that work outside the medical system that are working in health homes are demedicalizing medical clinics much more than the other way around. This is, I invite you all to, to take that and use that as your frame for thinking about how integration affects the different cultures. Well, I agree with you, and I think that what we're seeing now in the medical world are um, these incentives that require you to help your um, patient and your clients, or whatever we are calling them, um, to change their behavior to be healthier. And more and more is that realization in order to meet these incentives. You, you have to more than diagnose the prescribed meds. Yeah. Which I think medical. There's more than that. But um, so I agree with you. I think especially in the safety net, I don't think that um, we should be nearly as concerned about it as we are. But I think it's really wonderful to use that as a as an opportunity to have a discussion mm -hmm. about who's um are we becoming medicalized or are we becoming whole well, I don't know what the other term is, holisticized, which is like totally made up word. <laughs> um, but I think it's, I think so, and I think what you call it, if you call it a medical home, it just gives it all the wrong signals, which is really what you're saying. And I go back and forth because I like to play around with how confusing the terminology is right now, as opposed to consciously wanting to land on one term. Uh, any other thoughts or comments about this stuff before I go into the wiring diagrams? <laughs> Yes. One of the other things that um, I think is a connection <coughs> within these two different forms is uh, it seems like the folks concentrating on the most efficient delivery of care, of medical care, are going more into the virtual, get people into using technology, um, sort of almost depersonalizing the connection between the provider and the patient, if you will. Whereas um, many of us in this room uh, recognize that the key to addressing people who have barriers in the social determinants of care, the most effective way of, address, of having them be able to be successful and address those barriers are indeed through relationships, through the trusting and building relationships with other people within the system. So there's a very, that that is another different kind of um, culture balancing in the different pieces of the system. Yeah, I, I, thank you. I, I totally agree with you. And, you know, my wife is an American family therapist who's worked in this field for a long time, and, and we talk about this all the time, and, and her hypothesis is um, nurse primary care uh, nurse practitioners and marriage family therapists are two of the most important um, occupations in the new healthcare ecosystem. And that there's been um, because of this whole inability for MFTs to get paid for by Medicare, it's really um, it's really perverted the importance of thinking about family <laughs> systems and the people that are trained in family systems, and, and I think it's going, it's huge. And, and the other thing is that um, that uh, there's a guy named Arnie Elstein, who's a doc who lives in San Francisco, who wrote a really wonderful paper called 
on medical home runs. If you Google medical home runs, it's, it was published in Health Affairs. And what he talks about is, so he did this great little research, mini research project a couple of years ago where he had a couple of foundations help him find primary care clinics that had, that were medical homes, medical homes, that's the term that he used, they had 30% higher quality and 30% lower costs. And this is in California, and, and you can actually find, you can actually count uh, quality indicators and costs from the primary care clinics in California. And he when he found them, he interviewed them, and it was really cool, because what he found was that there were just a couple things different between those medical home runs and the other medical homes. And one was that every patient who had a chronic health condition had a personal relationship with somebody that worked in that clinic, but generally their care manager, such that if I had diabetes and I woke up in the middle of the night with a foot infection, I was given permission. I, I knew that the first thing I should do is actually call my nurse care manager who was, you know, meet you at the ER. And if I ended up going into the hospital because of a foot infection, because of my diabetes, the clinic would take it very personally as a personal failure of, of that clinic. And it's that kind of relationship, the importance of relationship is really critical. The second thing was um, they were meticulous about making referrals to high-performing specialists. Uh, not, most referrals are made, if you read the research, to people in, in doctors' social networks, people they went to, to medical school with and stuff like that, or they play golf with it. And it's making, being very meticulous about the referrals that you make. And, and again, that's a relational, it's a relationship and a different, and a, and a different, and a different kind of way, David. Chuck, I think you said that very well. And you know, the planning group we've been working with is debating whether we would look at coming up with a plan and a model or whether we would um, see others do that. And I think exactly what we're talking about is why King County is perched to do really well in this next uh, era. I mean, what you've been doing, the particular model of public health you've been doing in King County, is a lot about relationship, a lot about very pragmatic people going to work uh, with, with uh, people all throughout the county. And also on the, the whole network we put together through the years where we have lots and lots of different providers. There's a lot of relationship between uh, the people in, in the provider agencies and also a lot of the models are very much relationship based. Now that we're doing peer support specialists. So I think this is one of the reasons why I'm really excited about the possibilities of King County to a safety net ACO. So um, so this is my picture of how the current healthcare system is wired <laughs> in this country. <laughs> and then this is my Visio diagram that I put together with a guy named Andy Keller, who some of you may know, where uh, the status quo is we have lots of health planning efforts, and then, um, and then there's funding silos. Um, and... Um, and then the health plans and the counties and the RSNs and the other payers have individual contracts with individual organizations, okay? So, so what you have is, um, I bet you, let's see, I don't know if anyone's done this, but if you took all the, con if you took all the contracts to, from all the payers to all the folks that are safety net providers that were sort of in that picture of the accountable care organization to the safety net and sort of deconstructed those contracts to say how many different performance measures are there, how many different payment models are there, how many different contract terms are there, and then, and then did a little analysis of, of the conflicts among them all, you would go, oh my gosh, you know, these, if you do more than one thing, you're set up for failure. If you turn this into an ACO, and you don't change that, the ACO is going to fail. The safety net ACO is going to fail because it's, it's giving all these different signals. And I hang out with this group of people that have work, been working on payment reform for several years. And about three years ago at the conference in D.C., there were some people on a panel talking about the pay for performance pilots in Minneapolis, Minnesota, and there were 18 paid for performance pilots that were underway in, in Minneapolis at the same time, 
and if there were a number of health care providers that were involved in four or five different paper performance pilots, and if you pretend like you're a doc or a nurse practitioner or a marriage and family therapist working in one of those clinics, and there's five different models for how, for how paper performance is playing out, it's like, okay, so what do I do? And the reason why the pay for performance pilot in Washington that's underway that's being cooked up is an all payer model is because that's like a, that's another recipe for disaster. So this is a really big problem. Uh, how the wiring diagram? So the question, my big question is, is is the wiring diagram going to change healthcare reform in polls in Washington or not? That's sort of the sixty-four dollar question for me. Um, and um, and so you know what is what about the unfolding healthcare authority design? Okay, um, so all Medicaid enrollees um, for most most all of the Medicaid enrollees are being moved into managed care, and um, we don't our centers are in tech now, but we don't know if they're going away. And um, there's payment from pilots, and there's ACO pilots, and um, but the but the thing is is that there's not an integrated conceptual model that says we need to come up with a single set of payment reforms, contract terms, performance measures across all the providers in the safety net so that the housing folks are getting the same messages as the folks that are working on behavioral health, as the folks that are working on getting the social services, as folks as the folks that are providing health care. And so I'm really concerned that, that, that this model is, um, may not be robust enough. So, you know, I've been talking to the healthcare cabinet, and like I said, and, and people in the healthcare cabinet in various and sundry meetings, and here's what I think is going on. Um, the model that exists now in the mind of folks in the healthcare authority is really quite simple. We come up with a very solid contracting design and then we hire health, Medicaid health plans who then implement it in the story. And, and somehow those Medicaid health plans are gonna work with all the other, all the other folks that they don't pay money to in the safety net and everything's gonna turn out all right. And I'm going, I'm going, I don't, I really don't think that's gonna work. And, and I think that the folks who have, um, who, who are working on this, when I start talking about that picture of all the other books in the safety net, their brains are already so full with trying to figure out this new procurement for, for July 2012 that I think I'm pushing them over the edge and their heads are going to explode. <laughs> How can I possibly think about all this other stuff when I, when I have like lawsuits from the hospital association and, and, and trying to get these contracts up and, and it's, I think it's just very overwhelming. And so. What's happening is what happens all around the country, which is when it comes to redesigning the system at the Medicaid level, people actually do understand the social determinants of health. And, they, and the, one, well, the ones that are smart, and they say, but I don't have the bandwidth to get around to that now, so we'll get around to it later. And that's, that's, what, I see, that's what I think is unfolding the safe sharing. This is just music to my ears because from the you know individual healthcare provider point of view, um, there's just so much complexity. And I hope, hopefully, when you're talking to the state, you're also making the point that a single individual can move back and forth between silos, sometimes totally unknown to the healthcare provider. When I start my patient care days, one of the first things I do is look up everybody in provider one so I know what silo they're in yeah. today. Yeah. Exactly. So and you know, I've been working with um uh, you're gonna serve on some projects and and one of this little project that we're working on is um is coming up with a pay for performance model for um for folks in one of the underpinnings in uh in the disability lifeline in the Medicaid system and one of the underpinnings is really quite simple. And every person in, who's in the safety net in the state should have one problem list, one medication list, one care plan that's available to all the providers that are providing services that are part of that care plan. And that care plan is just not a medical care plan. It's, it's, a, 
It's a comprehensive care plan, and there should never be more than one care manager. You know, and if, if we did this project in Clark County 12 years ago, and there were these people that had three, four, and five care managers, case managers, because they were being served by three, four, and five different silos. And, and that's just like, that's got to be fixed. Yeah, I mean, I know that you know that, but we have to be very, we have to figure out how to, so the question is, how do we go about fixing that when the state is so overwhelmed by what's going on with uh, with their healthy options procurement and expansion of Medicaid? David? You know, one of the biggest elephants in the room and in the community right now is the second poll about the RSNs. And I'm really in, intrigued with seizing our own future and not feeling victimized by things that's happening at the federal and state level. And I would think that rather than worrying that RSNs are going away, if we were to get ambitious about putting together a uh, uh, safety net ACL in King County, really the role of the county is bigger. It doesn't get diminished. Am I making sense when I say that? So, so yeah, so this is, I just sort of blew by that bullet, didn't I? So uh, Oregon has already decided that they're blowing up the RSNs. In Oregon, they're called MHOs, mental health organizations. They've already decided that they're blowing up the MHOs, and so it's a, it's, it's like, for all intents and purposes, a done deal. And, and the MHOs have basically realized that. Uh, let's see. First, they thought that they were toast, and then they, and then the second thing they thought was, oh, um, hmm, you know, all, all this risk. The most complex people in the state have multiple chronic health conditions and mental health and or substance use disorders. And those people that are going to be managed by the health plans in Oregon, um, uh, if they don't have expertise in, um, in managing and helping the folks who have behavioral health disorders, which the health plans by and large don't, um, the health plans are going to fail. So there's all these, it's really important to look at what's happening in Oregon. So instead, I'm going to talk about Bend, Oregon in just a minute. And what they did was the three county area was the, the MHO turned his contract back to the state before the state pulled the contract. And that contract came to the health plan, the only one health plan in that three county region. And then before this all happened, the health plan created a contractual arrangement to hire the MHO to manage mental health and drug and alcohol. Um, so and so they're working together side by side, and so they actually preempted the pulling the plug by giving, see in Oregon the health plans manage health and drug and alcohol, and the MHOs manage mental health. And so this MHO got kept its its mental health and got its drug and got the drug and alcohol business so that they're creating through integrated behavioral health benefit and they're working very closely with health plans. Uh, so those kind of, so there's, there's actually several examples of what's happening with MHOs um, uh, because the, when I talk about people that work in behavioral health, whether it's at the administrative level or the delivery system level, is in five years, you're gonna have a job that, that you're gonna like more, that's gonna pay more, and you're gonna be much more valued by your colleagues in the healthcare community it's just because of what you do is so incredibly important, whether it's administrative or clinical, you just may not be working for the same organization. And I really think that's true because we, we're just, it's just so clear that that mom with diabetes depression, that, that we just have so, we have so much underfunded behavioral health that we can't fix the healthcare system without addressing the whole suite of stuff. Yeah? And then you, um, right away in terms of the, challenge if, if you kind of have a office-based uh, model or paradigm that's sort of medically driven when you, you think about the fact that managed care organizations and big primary care practices and so forth don't have the infrastructure, don't have the connections to the, the community organizations, the people that are doing the case management around, for instance, how to things like that. How do, what do you think about the, the idea of rather than I mean, not necessarily to the exclusion of creating a big systematic change, which is obviously important. But what do you think of the idea of piloting 
some uh, projects that focus on the highest risk people, the people with, that are homeless, that have been homeless, that have seen issues, where there is infrastructure that's pretty easily identifiable. And, and using that infrastructure, getting it together, and uh, to almost sort of being entrepreneurial the way the Bend Oregon organization was that you just talked about. Yeah, absolutely. So, so in my mind, um, what you do around um, how changing organizational structures or creating conceptual models and frameworks is, um, it's re I'm using, for me, the 80-20 rule is the 20% of your energy into, into sort of fixing the wiring diagram, and you put 80% of your energy into what you just said. And you start out with the, what we all have come to know and love as the 550 population, which is the 5% of the Medicaid enrollees that are using 50% of the Medicaid spend. And then you, and you, you do that to free up savings. And, um, and so you're already doing that, but what I'm saying is, is I want, I, I think that you, um, it, you need to keep doing it and do more of it. Um, because right now, there's st everyone is still working in their silos of excellence to a large degree, and we need to we need to have one care plan, one problem list, one medication list of accessible to all. That's part of the care team, even if it crosses over multiple organizations. I totally think, and I've got some slides that that say that reiterate what you just said. It's absolutely, absolutely essential. So, so let me just say that. Um, that I have a huge amount of respect and empathy for people in the health, the folks that are working in the healthcare authority in terms of what a huge job that they have. And so in, in my brain, I'm going, you know, maybe we shouldn't put all the responsibility on the shoulders of the executive branch in Washington State to come up with the design to, to blow up the silos and fix everything. So this whole regional health alliance concept that's on the next few slides are really about saying let's let's not try and ask the state to do more than it's capable of doing at this point in time. Yeah, I'm going to question, sorry. Um, I don't know what I'm seeing here is long-term care. So yeah. Where do they fit in this whole? So I think that, um, what was the question? Uh, where does long-term care fit into this time? I think that um, it's really quite simple. Everybody should have, who lives in King County, should have a health home that's customized to meet the needs of sort of where they are in their, um, in their life. And people that are, uh, so I'm going to just talk about the elderly part of the long-term care for a minute. I think that, um, that folks that are elderly who are at risk or are in nursing homes need to have these health Homes need to be, there need to be these health neighborhood one-stop shopping centers surrounded by a bunch of satellites. And I'm envisioning that at least half of the workforce are out in the community either working in shopping centers or community centers or nursing homes or assisted living facilities. And that, and that what we're doing is we're, this whole, that whole picture of the ACL for the safety net, that one of their goals in life their major goal is to, when you say help people move towards health, I want to take it down one layer. They need to become hospital, jail, and long-term care facility prevention organizations. And uh, and so when you think about what what the seniors need, who um, are either soon to be members of the long-term care community are, are already there that it's really about saying, you know, trying to help them uh, in a customized way. But so, but I don't know if I spoke to what your question was. Well, it's a question of paper. I mean, that the ACOs responsible for the, for the payment of long-term care services, or is that someone else's still playing to that separately? So, uh, you know, some of us remember the days before there were, um, when there was an RSN, but the state held all the risks for hospital stuff. And, uh, and, and, and so what was happening is that if you all were moving to help, I'm, so, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm thinking about the mental health system. If you all in the mental health system were helping reduce the inpatient costs, that money, you didn't see any of that money. And so um, what needs to happen is that 
we need to come up with financial models where either the long-term care costs are folded into this comprehensive model or there's contractual arrangements so that if I'm a health fund or I'm a, I'm a health provider or I, I do kind of what your organization does that, and we help bend the cost curve for the folks that we work with that, that we reap some we, there, we are, have access to the shared savings model. There's 27 different ways you can set up who the payers are as long as there's a contractual arrangement that if what we do bends the cost curve and it saves somebody money that that money ought to come a, share, a portion of that money ought to come to us as a share, as a bonus for the work that we've done, and so, um, and so, uh, there's a lot of risk embedded in long-term care right now. It's on the shoulders of the state. How do we start um, both spreading some of that risk out and re reaping some of the rewards um, from from changing the model? So, so do we take long-term care money and fold it into the health plans in 2014? Is and just go away from the current model, maybe, maybe not. That's not the only way to go to actually turn this around for those folks. So that was a lot of words. Um, this is, this is full of, the, on one hand it's very complicated, and on the other hand it's actually quite simple if you keep coming back to, um, we got it, I didn't say this yet, so I, I don't want to say we, we need to keep coming back to it. We have to double the budgets of primary care in this country in order to bring down the utilization of all things inpatient and institutional. Okay, and we need to we need to increase the budgets of behavioral health so that there's enough behavioral health providers so that everybody who has a behavioral health disorder has access to care. And I don't know whether that's doubling the behavioral health budget or, or what the number is, because that number hasn't been quantified very well. But, but basically, we need to be spending more money uh, earlier on, including prevention and early intervention, in order to save money further downstream. And there's lots of there's lots and lots of data that says if you do it and you do it right, you will save a, you will save gazillions of dollars. That's a technical term. <laughs> Um, so, so we've been, like I said, stealing the best ideas, and you know, people know about the Puget Sound Health Alliance here. Is somebody on, in the room or on the phone from the Puget Sound Health Alliance? Okay, of course. Yeah, hi. We love you. Hello. And um, and you know, there's a there's a group of about like 65 uh, regional health improvement collaboratives around the country including the Puget Sound Health Alliance, that have been piloting, we gotta, we got to be thinking about patient education, performance measurement, delivery of care, technical assistance, provider organization coordination, payment and delivery system reform. So this idea of a regional health alliance I'm going to talk about in the next couple of slides is not only stealing from Bend, Oregon, but it's stealing from what the Puget Sound Health Alliance has been doing. It's stealing from what the Choice Regional Health Network has been doing around the Olympia area which is really, really creating a conceptual framework for how to achieve the triple aim for people and the safety hand in, this, in the case that we're talking about. And so, so if you talk to folks at the Future Sun Health Alliance and say, well, is your mission about, um, you know, how much of your mission is dealing with folks in the safety net? Um, she, what's your name again? Corey would probably say um, only part of what we do relates to that. What if, but Corey, um, what is the Puget Sound Health Alliance's mission in relation to uh, focusing on the safety net? We don't have like, a specific safety net. I mean, part of our mission is the top 10% performance nationally in delivery of quality evidence-based care and reduction of like all these variations in like our measures, but not a specific population, it's the entire population. Mm -hmm. So that's key component there that's like the thinking that area you're talking about is not super, I don't think we have a specific focus on it. However, it's definitely within our radar in terms of um, you know, readmissions and um, everything else going on in the community and bringing up. Right, right. So, so it's interesting to think about what kind of partnership is sitting out up there waiting to happen with the Puget Sound Health Alliance in terms of the folks in the room, because, like she said, 
they're they're not just saying we 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 think about everybody except folks in the safety net. Um, well, I mean, say not except, but like population wide. But how do we include um, maybe make a, a stronger not you know population wide, but a higher priority per se mm -hmm. in one area than the other. We don't do that right now. Right now, we're trying to you know break down our measures so we can look at specific. Um, components of our measurements and how people are being impacted in those areas, but we, have, we don't we have been able to do that yet. Got it. So, so, um, so the idea here is that you create this, okay, so you may have seen the term regional health authority, and we've been systematically purging the word authority from um, the projects that I've been working on, because when, when people hear the word authority, they think government bureaucracy that's going to, that's like um, stupid and just sucks up money and whether that's true or not um, people have found that that the word regional health association or regional health alliance is actually a much less uh, button pushing term so so um, you'll see that um, if you've seen other presentations I've done you'll see the change, name change in the slides but the idea here is that the payers get together and they organize themselves to support the delivery system to fix the problems I was talking about on the previous slide. And, and it's really that simple. That not only does the delivery system need to organize itself, but the payers need to organize themselves. Um, period, end of story. That's a regional health alliance is the payers in a region get together to create a, what the Institute of Medicine describes as a supportive payment and regulatory system in order to support organizations that field high-performing teams that achieve the aims described in Crossing the Quality Chasm. And, um, and what we've done is we've articulated eight things that a regional health alliance ought to be doing. And so when I think about King County, the question is, um, how many of these are you doing now? How many of these are you not doing now? So um, community needs assessment and improvement plan. Uh, Robin Henderson, who is in charge of this project in Bend, Oregon, in three counties from Bend, Oregon, they, they, what they did was they got legislation passed at the state to allow them to have one health, region-wide health planning, I'm sorry, health planning process. And they counted up how many they statutorily were required to do and there were 44. All the, all the entities in that three county region were required, there were 44 health plans, health planning plans that had to be prepared and submitted to the various payers and authorities. And so, so the idea here is to integrate it into one community wide health planning and assess, needs assessment and improvement plan that addresses everybody in the safety net. And then for the payers, to come together and create and, and answer the questions. Okay, if we were thinking about all the things that help people going towards health, and we took we had United Way and we had other foundations and we had all these guys and gals, let's create a virtual budget that says how many people are in the safety net in King County, what kind of services and supports do they need to help them move towards health really. Um, how much, what kind of demand is that going to be in terms of provider by type? What's the cost going to be? And, and, and how much are we in or out of balance with how much money all these people have when you add it all up together? And then what you do is you basically get um, these folks to start funding community-wide <coughs> health improvement projects doing have spotting like they were talking about um, right away before you get this whole thing set up. And then you... And then what you do is you get this gang to say, we're going to come up with one set of payment models, one set of contract terms, one set of performance measures, so that we're all giving the same signals to everybody. See, these folks will still, whoever is still standing as a state does its deciding who gets to be payers in the system, they'll, they'll still be standing, they'll still contract, but the, their desired contractee is a uh, safety net ACO. And, um, and they, they support, they put, push money into helping develop persons in health care homes, supporting local ACL developments, 
supporting, I know that you guys are working on this, supporting this stuff, developing a community-wide performance measurement system. So what we're really talking about, again, is the organizing the pairs to do key tasks so that all I, in my own little selfish mind, all I care about is that people who live in this community and the safety net move achieve the triple aim, and it's the providers in the community that are going to be the ones that that uh, make that happen, not the purchasers. The purchasers need to support the providers to make that happen. Now, can you just, when you say payers, yeah, who all is included in that term? So, so uh, that's that's a great question. So, um, let me start to say, purchasers are not are generally not payers. So, purchasers are um, are the state of Washington. Purchasers are. Boeing and Microsoft and, and companies that hire health, that contract with health plans. Purchasers are buying health coverage for a population. What most purchasers do is they contract with a payer to um, manage that whole thing who then contracts with providers. So the, the payers are the managed care companies or the health plans or um, or people give donations to United Way, United Way, the purchasers are the people making the donations. The payer is United Way. So those are those payers too are in this ecosystem. And they're contracting with providers to deliver care. And everybody's doing doing it in their own way with their own set of rules. And so I separate purchasers, which are up there from from payers, from providers. Now, did, I, did I answer your question? Or did, but it, it just seems, I mean, in my experience, you know, dealing with uh, United Way is one thing. Uh, dealing with the Camino or Regions or Primera is, is another thing. And, and just, I, I just wonder about the interests of, of the payers and the extent to which, how do you, how do you incentivize them to to play, um, you know, I can I can for example I, I can remember sitting in a few uh, sound helplines quality improvement meeting suggesting that at sort of along the lines of something you know, you've alluded to just a small piece you know why don't all the managed care organizations pool the money that they put in disease management independently contracting with each of them with different vendors uh, who are external to the community so. They, you know, if they come and go, and when they come and go, there's nothing left in the community by virtue of their having been there for two or three years. Um, and 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 the plan, they, they had no interest in in doing that kind of a kind of a thing at that time. So, and, and really, it, it, you know, it's very much along the lines of what you're saying. It's, it's let's pool our resources, and and uh, and then deploy them as effectively as we can, you know, with, within the community and and. From what I'm hearing, and, you know, that's, that includes building out sort of community-based infrastructure and so forth. So, so I, don't, I mean, I, I can see where certain payers potentially, you know, that, that contribute to healthcare services broadly, to, to health uh, promotion services, and, you know, uh, consistent with some of the ideas that have been put forth here, are, you know, do do that. Um, but but not everybody who you know puts some money in. and that's one of the things that worries me about the state, as you were saying, where where their you know their, their idea here is, is we're just going to contract with, with managed care organizations and and right now on on the to the extent that we just have healthy options and we just have Molina CHPW and then the new folks down south the state the name escapes me here. Sort of relatively new players, so we're going to now we have the potential to have many more plans, much more fragmentation, and what what's going to get them to come to the table? Because you know, at the end of the day, my, my sense is that, that once they they give in on some of these things or or collaborate in that way, that that there's from their mind there's nothing that differentiates them anymore. Yeah. So so um, I. I think that, that that was really helpful for you to um, describe that now, because um, what's going here's what I think is going to happen. Um, down in Clark County, 
I'm in Vancouver where we're organizing the Southwest uh, Regional Health Alliance. Uh, people were, were asking the same question, and rather than me answering it, the guy from Kaiser, Kaiser has lives in Clark County, he got up and he said, and he answered it, and he said, I have, we have a bunch of very complicated folks who have all these social and behavioral health needs and housing needs, and what we've done is we've hired social workers to actually do care management with them. It's because we're like freaking out about the fact that these folks cost the most. But we don't have access to any of that money for housing and social services and other stuff. And so, so we're joining the RHA because we see that it's going to help us achieve the triple aim for our patients in a way that we can't achieve it by ourselves because um, there's all this money that's outside with the healthcare authority is thinking about that, that, that our patients need. So, what I, so for them, because they get it, they're joining the RHA creates a competitive advantage with them. So Molina's down there. So let's, I don't, let's just say Molina says, oh, I'm, I'm going to do it myself and I'm going to, I'm not, I'm going to ignore, I'm not going to become part of this club. So this is a voluntary organization. Nobody's forced to join it. Um, they, I bet you a dollar that Kaiser will do a better job tackling the social determinants of health than Molina will be able to. And guess what? The co their, their costs, their health, see when you do that, you save money in emergency room and inpatient and diagnostic imaging. Those are the three big areas. So they'll, the, they'll probably end up doing a much better job bending the costs for Kaiser Wheel than Molina and so this is interesting because I think it's fine if regents or premier don't want to join. They're just not joining at their own risk in terms of their ability to bend the cost curve because they don't have access to the other resources in the safety. See, if this succeeds, what I said is true. If this just becomes another bureaucratic layer that just sucks money out of the system rather than saves money, then Molina will be and regents and premier would be better off not joining. So what you're doing, if you're a health plan, around making a strategic decision about whether to play in this arena or not, is what do you think the probability of helping me bend the cost curve is? And, and, and then you may still go against your innate competitiveness of not want to play in the same sandbox as your competitors, and you, 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 you resist that at your own financial risk. What do you do if you're a provider, though? Well, if you're a provider, okay, so I'm a health home, and all of you, and I, I'm, I'm a CFO of a health home, and all of you sign up with primary products work at my health home, and some of you have Premier, and some of you have United, and some of you have Region, some, some of you have Alina. Well, uh, I, in this model, if everybody joined, I would have one set of payment models, one set of contract terms, one set of performance measures, but if, if Three of them join and three of them don't. Then I still have I still have this problem, and I just deal I have to deal with it. Just like the providers have to deal with the mess now. So it's 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 going to be it's going to be messy to the degree that folks that are the health plans do something different than what everybody else is, who aren't in here than ever, the folks that are in here do something. Yes. So back to the class discussion before this one. It seems that you're presuming that somewhere in this system there's a lot of money to deal with things like housing, homelessness, and, and the other, you know, a lot of people call it ancillary services. There was a time that was true. I'm not sure it is true anymore. So if the expectation of the payers for medical services is that they're going to tap into these, these piles of money lying about for, for other services is, is going to lure them in. I think at least as things stand today, they're going to be really disappointed. Yeah, see, I don't think anybody has illusions that the safety net, that the social service providers and housing providers are, have oodles of money sitting around. See, it's really, here's the, here's the, the financial model. If you have five care managers working with somebody and you only need one, there's, there's system savings there. 
Uh, what they're doing in Central Oregon is, um, let me just talk about Central Oregon. I'll come back to the other slide. And what they did was they got all of these guys and gals together to create this thing that we're talking about today. And uh, so it's the counties, it's the FQHCs, it's, there's one health plan, uh, social service agencies, the hospital, the, this is the MHO, etc. cetera, and um, behavioral health providers. And uh, what they did was they said, we're going to start out, we're going to act as if we are, we're a uh, uh, regional health alliance, ACO, and we're going to start organizing what you did. We're going to start working on the 550 projects for the population. And so they did three things. They took the, um, the basically the 100 highest, most expensive folks in the FQHC. They took the 100 highest utilizers of the emergency room. And they took the kids with uh, complicated physical health conditions who had the highest cost, and they th created three projects to wrap care around them. And what they did was they, um, so here's the one for the, the 120 highest cost consumers out of the 6,000 patients at the FQHC. So this is the 5%, the most expensive 5%. And they wrap care around them. Uh, they, and they, they, if you haven't read The Hot Spotters by uh, Atul Gawande, that's what they basically did was they did hot spotting and they got care around them. They brought down the emergency room utilization, the inpatient emissions, and then they increased the stuff that they wanted to increase. And but before they started this project, you have to understand that it took money to, um, this is a long answer to your question, so bear with me. They took money to uh, different parts of the system who funded these care managers. And they called them investors. And then the health plan, which was the group that was going to make, reap the savings from this, agreed that if they saved, that if we, if you guys brought down our PMPM for these patients, our cost for these patients, we will take a, the majority of that savings and we'll put it into a bank account for the next project. So what happens is you have the safety net folks developing one care plan that's integrating the, the small amount of resources that they have to start with. So new money getting put in to um, prime the pump so that they could actually do better care management. And then a rule about an agreement that if there's money that was saved. So what happens is they're, they create this feedback loop as they saved money from inpatient emergency room, diagnostic imaging, et cetera, that goes back into the system, not into the, as evidence to the shareholders of the health plan. So you have to have that kind of set of agreements. And so it's not so much the health plans are, are looking to tap. There is money that, there is money for housing and for social services, but, and so that's coming into the treat care plan in a way that it didn't before. It's just not, it's nobody, everybody knows it's not like noodles and noodles of money, if that makes any sense. So that's the framework that people are doing as they're working on these projects. Um, Let me stop you for a second. Please. I'm very curious about the second topic that you talk about. It. And we know that the Tri-County area there is quite rural. And with pretty much a single up to HC, right? Uh, there's, there's more than one, but there's one large one. So um, how do you imagine this kind of a model in a community of complex system towns? So, um, so if, let me say that, um, let's see, it's way more complicated. <laughs> and, and let me say that if I'm, if I'm, if I, uh, there's this great paper that's at the end by Health Management Associates about creating accountable care and the safety net, and they talk about the seven things they need to do to do that. And the first thing is somebody has to step up, and what the somebody has to and the, to provide leadership, and what that leadership about is about is actually helping organize the payers. See, whatever you can organize the payers to give to stop giving. These signals to the delivery system, 
you're going to, because in a little bit, you're going to be better off. I don't have any illusions that everyone's going to sit kumbaya and everything's going to look happily ever after. But I think that you can organize, you can organize the peers that want to join the club to do the things that I'm talking about, to do this list. And you can support the development of safety and hit ACOs in this community. And, it, and you can change the payment model. You can help change the payment model so that you're basically pushing money out to the delivery system in a way that actually pays people for improving health, not just pays people for generating wages. And it's infinitely more complicated in King County than it is in um, in, in the Tri-County area in Bend. But you know, but you check that the Fulton County should be somewhat more complementary to what we have here, right? Because it's Atlanta. Yeah, it's Atlanta. Yeah. And, and the thing about Atlanta is they, they did that healthcare neighborhood without any extra money. And what they basically did is we need to we need to get people working together. So because right now the money is see I I've lived here for 32 years and I know that that not every dollar in this county that goes for services is used as efficiently and as effectively as possible. And so that the reality is 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 um is that. We have to all work together, to, and the reason why is because of the wiring diagram that I showed on the, on, you know, the earlier slide. There is a lot of money and waste in the system in this community because of the wiring diagram that's in place. I just want to remind people that we've done this. We look at this slide that Ella has right here. Sharon and Anna and Karen, we think it's a GAU pilot. We have the seat for it right there. We have all these providers. We have the health plans and the county RSS coming together as, as peers. Uh, we have uh, uh, coherence and outcomes expected to be bring together government dependency, housing, support and employment, behavior health. We, we've done this. We've shown that we can do this. We've shown the research has shown that it's a safe money. Sherry, am I overstating that? Um, I don't know if the research has shown that it's good money. But it has, they have, they have saved tons of money in other communities, and um, and uh, the, the disability lifeline pilot is um, there are some pretty promising results. Um, but your point is well taken, and your point is well taken. Um, so so this slide here that that sort of has a bunch of visio diagrams kind of pasted together is is. From my perspective, the most okay. So I was at um, giving a talk at the Children's System of Care Conference up in Bellingham a couple, two weeks ago, and Susan Dreyfus was on the panel, and and she she and she talked about how um, this picture was the most important picture for the healthcare cabinet because what it did was it created a conceptual model that says we've got the federal government working on healthcare reform. We have state government working on health care reform, but the feds can't do it without the states. And my contention is this, that all health care is local, and the state, using its model of contracting with health plans, is not going to fix, is not going to achieve the triple line for people in the safety net. The, the communities have, there has to be something at this level. If, see, I don't believe for a minute that the state is going to be able to organize all the payers in the way that I'm talking about organizing the payers at the regional level. And so if you create this regional health improvement collaborative slash regional health alliance slash regional health association slash payers group, fund, um, that, that these local entities do work are the ones that should be working on those eight tasks to support the development of health care neighborhoods slash integrated health systems slash safety and accountable care organizations. And that this is an essential ingredient. If you don't have this, I think we lose. And if everybody is, if anybody in this row is rowing in a different direction, we lose. That we all have to, we all have to focus on what the AAA means for our communities and we, and we have to put the right structures in place. And if, it, and if you were to not put together something in King County, I think you lose. And if you were to put together something that's not the right thing and it's overly bureaucratic or, or whatever, the, or you're spending 80% of your time 
on the boxes of the York Chart rather than maybe spend your time on helping the delivery system succeed, you lose. But for me, this is, this is, I just can't figure out how in a state like this where people are so overwhelmed up here, how you make this succeed without local communities organizing themselves. So that, that's my, my bottom line is, is I've been, I've been in 19 states working on how trying to help healthcare reform and, and I think that states that don't do this are going to fail. Are they doing that in Vermont or some of the other places? So, so let's talk about Vermont. Um, Vermont is, um, there are 637,000 people that, that live in Vermont. So how many people live in Seattle? <laughs> About that many? Yeah. That many people live in Baylor. So, so Vermont, population-wise, is the size of Seattle. And, and so, so Vermont, what Vermont has basically done is they've come up with a model where they've identified communities and um, and they're pushing out this model. So so basically, the state, the, Vermont, the state is doing is doing this. Is doing um, is doing this work here. Okay, so that's exactly what's happening in Vermont. But the state is doing this. They're organizing uh, the payers and and changing the healthcare ecosystem and they're supporting ACOs. And so the key home rents for Vermont is that they're doing the work of our RHA because they're small enough. And they're working with medical homes, they're working with public, bringing public health, bringing behavioral health in, bringing hospitals in, creating ACOs. And their home run, a super home run, or grand slam home run, I think, is their community health teams. Do, do, have you read about the Vermont community health teams? So, so what they've done is the state has said, we're going to take, for every community of 20,000 people, we're going to push a $350,000 per year grant um, to that community, for them to hire a five-person community health team. And the job of that community health team is to help people with hospital transitions, to help people get connected up with medical homes or primary care clinics if there are medical homes in the community, to help people who aren't um, filling the prescriptions to help people who aren't showing up to their appointments. They're basically in care management for people that don't have care managers and a patient-centered medical home slash person-centered health home. And the community decides, the 20,000 person neighborhood decides which five FTEs that they hire. The, the team is head by an RN, so there's that rule, but you can, the team, they, the community can basically decide who else they want to hire. And these are the people they're hiring. And so, so they're basically saying we got to do more. We got to do a lot more prevention. We got to do a lot more care management. We got to do um, a lot more connecting the dots. To, uh, to and, and the idea is they're flooding the communities basically with with um, with staff further down, further upstream, as opposed to waiting for people to end up in the ERs and the hospitals. They have saved a whole, a whole ton of money. So we do have, there's a report that came out, that's the 2010 report, that shows how much money that they've, they've saved an emergency room and inpatient from, um, from this model, pushing this model out in the pilot communities. Let's see, I'm gonna see what, if there are other sort of, um, so this is how much they, so they saved 19% inpatient, 13% ER, I'm sorry, they've reduced inpatient and ER utilization by this much. And they did save enough money. They did save substantial money that they've reinvested back into the next projects. This is up on back in Central Oregon. And um, so if you haven't read, again, if you haven't read the Hotspotter article, this is uh, a representative of 1% of the um, population uses a third of the money. And What's on the phone? Uh, if you could uh, check to make sure that you're on mute, that would be helpful. Thank you. So just real quickly, we know that in Camden, they've, um, you know, Jeffrey Brenner uh, used the police mapping of crime hotspots to start 
finding out where people who that's the healthcare hotspots are, and they basically found the places where there were the highest costs, and they basically started making interventions, in, including uh, wrapping care around folks. And um, and so they, you know, if you, have people seen the Frontline piece, the 10 or 12 minute, you can go out, you can go to Frontline, you can Google Frontline uh, Dr. Hotspot, or Frontline Bill Gawande, they, they have a tour of Gawande and Jeffrey Brenner, and it's a really nice a little 12 minute piece on, um, on what the, the project here. And, and again, what they did was they, they found the most expensive people and they got care around them. And, they, and they've been saving. And so at the end of Jeffrey, at that piece, Jeffrey Brenner says, Camden is the first city in the United States. We want to make it the first city in the country where we, we absolutely bend the cost curve by the work that we're doing. And if we think that if we can pull it off here, there's nobody else in the country, there's no place else in the country where they have an excuse not to be able to do this. And so that, that's really pretty cool that, that they're working on that. Um, let's see if I have anything useful to say about Eastern Washington. Um, oh, yeah. Um, so there's nine counties that are building this here. There are four or five counties. Three or four counties that are building it here. There are five counties that are working on it here. There are four or five counties that are working on it up in the northwest part of the state. And um, and so what they're, they're doing is they're basically saying, we're, we're just stepping up and we're organizing this. So in, um, in Spokane, the three Spokane County commissioners got in a big room with people but kind of like the meeting that you had, that, that was the group that came. And they basically said, we have, we're supporting this idea of creating this RHA to help succeed at rewiring the healthcare ecosystem in Eastern Washington. And they're going to create a board, have a student community, there's a design team, and these work groups are mostly working on, um, well, they're working on the infrastructure, and they're working on the clinical improvement projects. So funding the RHA, the legal structure, the legislative agenda, performance measurement, payment reform, this is the sort of wiring stuff. And then they're working on hotspot, they're going to be working on hotspotting, emergency room diversion, expanding access. I mean, again, these are things that you are doing in this community, but they're organizing this so that all these dots connect. So these are the, these are the, the menu of things that they're going to be deciding what they want to work on for second, third, etc. So, what would it make sense for the state to do relative to health care reform with this idea of uh, regional health and it's based off of Washington State? I'm sorry, what was your question? Yeah, so what should the state of Washington do in terms of organizing health care reform in Washington State if regional health care alliances came off of Washington State? So, so um, what I would do is actually quite simple, which is I would, um, I, as the state is designing, see, the, the state says we need an 18 month bridge contract from July of 2012 through December of 2013 to move everybody into managed care. And we can only bite off the health part of that. And if you look at the RP, there, you know, it's in there it says the health plans need to coordinate with local communities, and they've been calling everybody, the health plans have been calling everybody up and saying we want to coordinate with you. Um, but, uh, but as they design the system for, two, they basically have two years to decide what they're going to do starting January 2014 when 500,000 new people come into Medicaid. And that, what I think that needs to happen is that these RHAs need to be part of that 2014 design so that there's some contractual expectation as opposed to would it be nice if for the health plans to participate in, um, in, in, these, in these kind of arrangements. And, and see, I don't, think, I don't think there's lots of things that the state needs to do except acknowledge and support um, local communities to organize themselves locally 
And so for me, it's it's um, it's not hurting in language that makes that disembowels the efforts that you might start. It's not hurting in language that um, that creates obstacles or clashes. It's really saying, you know, we it's that picture. We have our role as a state in the same way the feds have their role, and we acknowledge that all healthcare is local. In the model of health plans being the only vehicle getting health care dollars to help people in the safety and move for, for its, uh, the triple aim, is, it doesn't work. But, but you know, I, beyond that, that's a pretty platitudinal field answer to your question. Because I, I think that there's not a lot that they really need to do except help support you, if, you know, if the regions of the state that work on this. But there is, aren't they a process of defining a lot of concerns as ways that could both create those barriers or allow us to do what you're saying yeah. as we speak? Well, well, see, they're very, I mean, the folks I've talked with the, the, the state are very conscious that this, that what the design for 2014 is needs to be much more robust than this bridge contract design. And so they are putting in, I'm expecting that they're going to change a lot of stuff over the next couple of years uh, to address the things we're talking about in some way, shape, or form, or they're just not going to succeed. But you're right. I mean, both things are happening as we speak. You see, I think mostly when it, the people at the healthcare authority are just over, so overwhelmed with what they're doing that this stuff is just not on their radar screen. They don't have the bandwidth for this right now. So that's why I think. It's really important for you all to step up and, and work on this. Do you have any concept of um, uh, how it, it's easier it, in any community if, if there's not an unlimited number of health plans? We well, you know Oregon. Let's see. Let me answer the question by going to Oregon. Oregon. Um, Oregon started off. They're creating this thing called a. Um, they're stopping calling, in Oregon they're called fully capitated health plans, FQHPs, and they're doing away with this, which those are, a Medicaid health plan is an FQHP, a fully capitated health plan. They're doing away with the term FQHP as opposed to FQHC, and they're creating this thing called CCO, which is a coordinated care organization, which is being designed to be much more comprehensive than the, the, health, than the Washington health plan model, okay? And so the CCO, what they're doing in Oregon with the CCO design is kind of what I want, is simply what I want Washington to do with, with their health plan design for 2014, which is to say, you know, all the things that are in the safety net really need to be part of this new healthcare ecosystem. And you have to just, if you're a health plan, you need to design um, that ecosystem proactively or we're not going to hire you to be a health plan. And they started out saying we want to have just one CCO for each region of the state, and then um, and then Medicaid CMS came in and said we don't really like that idea. So so now they're 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 really looking at there's probably going to be more than one CCO. But they've also said having too many CCOs in, in a region is a bad idea. So your point is well taken. And what Washington State is doing is, is potentially the opposite of, of where Oregon is going with that. Oh, really? Because Washington State is, Washington is trying to pull this. I mean, everybody in their in their aunt Jenny who has a health Medicaid health plan in the country has been um is is going to um sign up to be a health plan in the state. And so there will be more Medicaid health plans in Governor. There will be more in King County, and um. And so the whole design is to uh, encourage more of a market competition environment. So, so that's what's going to happen. And so it's going to. So you think about the wiring diagram. Um, it's going to get more complicated. And so that's what I'm saying. In 2014, when the new procurement comes up, I, I want to have stricter requirements about um, playing with the rest of the, the health improvement ecosystem than what's in the current RFP that should come out in September. A um, couple more slides. I know I've been talking to you for a really long time. So they've got a timeline. Um, 
there's immediate next steps. Also, what happened at the meeting, the organizing, so in Spokane, they had this organizing meeting that this group, Big Auditorium at Gonzaga, filled with people from all over the nine counties. And we talked, we did enough, it was a second meeting. So, so if you think about your meeting, your first meeting, community meeting, was, was um, not to do similar to their first community meeting. And then their second meeting was they did a recap, and uh, and they had uh, the first meeting they had the commissioner say we're we're supportive, and um, and we're we're going we're developing an RHA, and then um, and then they had people sign up for committees. So the outcome of that second meeting, which is actually what's happening next week in Southwest Washington, the outcome is we're going to actually constitute the work groups. And we're going to get started working on the things that, that are in that book. Um, these slides here, uh, this slide and this slide. And, and you'll see that there's, um, there's these work groups called organizational work group, measurement payment work group, health information work group, health planning work group, workforce work group, clinical improvement work group, clinical design work group. So we've had about, with, right after, and after the meeting, there were 50 people assigned up for work groups. And they're just starting to work to actually start doing what the base is saying. We want to get to where they are in Central Oregon as quickly as possible in terms of actually doing these permanent projects and bending the curve and just making it happen. So, Dale, um, talking about the state, feeling a little overwhelmed. Uh, I can relate to that. Yeah. What? So, what do you think is the timetable in which uh, these various organizations that watch the state need to get back to the, to the state, to the healthcare authority? And, and PSHS saying, here's what we're thinking of. What, what's the timeline for that, given you know, how fast the state is going to be? So, um, so, here's, uh, so here's what I think is going to happen. I think that there's going to be a piece of legislation that's submitted, that's put before the, that's brought up in the legislature in the 2012 session, that's going to say something about supporting you know, the executive branch supporting RHAs. I, and I have no idea what it's going to say, but there's going to be an RHA piece of legislation. And that RHA piece of legislation is going to try, I think the purpose of that is to be an intervention to get to keep the state the executive branch from blowing off these budding RHA efforts as, it's, as it works on designing uh, the 2014 design. Not, I'm not talking about the 2012 design, I'm talking about the 2014 design. And, and probably to not do anything on, along the way to, to trip up the efforts of the group. And so um, if uh, if we go back to that map, wherever it is, um, uh, I can tell you that, um, that if only these guys and these, um, these folks are the only two places that are supporting the legislation, it would be very different than if these folks, these folks, these folks, these folks, and these folks are supporting the legislation. I think King County is absolutely essential to uh, to making that um, piece of legislation that hasn't been even begun to be crafted yet going anywhere. So, so what I you know if I were giving advice. If you were, if, if this group or the planning group or the whole community said, you know, um, we really do need that community-based layer, or we're just going to be SOL, the South Park Department calls, um, I, it's really quite simple that uh, that you need to probably have the same name, same kind of conceptual framework that says they're doing it, they're doing it, they're doing, it, we're doing it. And what it is doesn't have to be fully fleshed out. And then um, but, and you need to start the ball rolling around putting together that picture of the board and the steering committee and the work groups and the design team. And, 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 um, and then work with your colleagues. So Christine's on the phone. Hey, Christine, are you still there? I'm still here. Can you hear me? Yeah, I forgot that you were on the phone. So Christine is the person who's spearheading this in eastern Washington. So, um, could you say something about the legislation that that's, um, 
just in, in a figment in our brains right now? I was just going to say it makes me laugh because um, I'm hoping you're really going to help be able to put that together. Um, I think the Oregon legislation, you know, probably won't work that well for us. Or maybe I haven't gotten through the, you know. No, 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 no. it totally won't work for you. Uh, but I think something very simple is what we need to put together and then, you know, start taking it to our legislators and all the other really critical um, legislators out there that we talked to, uh, I hope in, you know, October, and just start walking it around on October and November, some kind of draft that they can then comment on, and, and we can all and, uh, we can all change based on their comments, and then take it to them at the start of the session. Um, and, you know, at the same time, getting it to the state, uh, to all the folks we're working with, and having it be openly discussed is, you know, the desire of, I hope all of the regional health alliances um, in gaining support. So, so I, I forgot what your question was on, and did I? Well, it's a matter of timing and when we need to have some kind of, whether it's a fully formed plan or, as you said, some, you know, doesn't have to be fully fleshed out. But yeah. It's something that, that shows that we're part of, um, an effort that is going around across Washington State for counties and groups of counties to actually have some say about how health care is going to roll out in each of our communities. Yeah. And that's the key. I know that the, uh, that the health care authority is supposed to give recommendations to the legislature this uh, at the end of this year for them to consider regarding how mental health and substance abuse and long-term care and all those fit in with health care reform. So we need to have if they're going to come out with a proposal that says get rid of cars and get rid of this, we need to have something that says no, I don't want to do that. And legislators then need to pick and choose how they want to respond. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So, so I think timing, uh, timing is really important. And for me, it's it's um, uh, next year's legislative session is really critical. Um, there's a couple, there's just a couple more things I want to say. Um, so, I was hired to put together uh, how to get paid for integrated care to for California. And uh, this is going to be um, publicly released in the next week or two, and I'll make sure to get a copy for you. But what's really, it's really useful from, the, from two perspectives. One is we've uh, looked at all the research around the country, all the experiences that people have around getting paid for integrated care. And when I look at the barriers, that people, there are 10 barriers that we've identified, major barriers. If I look at those barriers, I go, how could anybody have succeeded at getting paid for integrated care because the, because the wiring diagram is all screwed up? And it's just a miracle that, it, that these projects that are doing integrated care you know, haven't all gone bankrupt. And it talks about how to overcome that. And there's, there's a little eight-step model for how to get paid for integrated care that I think is relevant for individual providers in the community as well as as well as the budding RHA efforts that we think about. Because what I want the RHAs to do is to look at that list of independent barriers and, and to say what can we have some control over as we're designing the RHA. When I think when I say you gotta help the delivery system succeed, my part of my brain goes right to this toolkit. Um, and then we we Another thing we did was that California is doing early Medicaid expansion, and we built a computer model to help them predict, um, analyze um, um, how much it's going to cost to expand Medicaid coverage and to build mental health and increase mental health and substance use for folks that are uninsured who are going to get early Medicaid. And so this is something that's available that I can share with you um, now. And, but one of the things that we're finding is, is there's a lot of good research that does show that if you, as you're building your models, um, you really, if you do it right, you really will save healthcare dollars if you provide behavioral services to people that hadn't had behavioral before that, who have complex health conditions, and building those cost sets, offsets is really important for the modeling exercise. And the last thing to say is, um, uh, Betsy Lieberman, who many of you know, uh, has started this ball rolling with organizing uh, health foundations in the state 
So, so these aren't purchasers or payers. They're health foundations that do various and sundry things around helping money. This is money spent on folks in the safety net in various and sundry ways. And the idea is, is wouldn't it be cool if not only the payers got organized, not only if the providers got organized, but what would happen if the health foundations got organized in the state that has never happened before to create a health um, foundation partnership to um, to um, help Washington succeed in health care reform. And some, some matching dollars potentially for federal funds for state projects. Regional Health Alliance seed money and accountable care organizations seed money are three efforts that um, have been talked about. And so this group, so this group of folks is, is getting organized as we speak. And actually, Christine was at a meeting that uh, where the folks from the state got together with the funders, got together with some folks from some of the communities, and at that meeting. Uh, that Christine was at from Spokane, uh, Emperor Health Foundation publicly announced that they were giving a grant to uh, the Eastern Washington Regional Health Alliance effort. Um, to sort of. So, anyways, that, that piece of the puzzle is a very important piece. Christine, did you want to say anything more about that? Did they did they renege and say, "Oops, we didn't really mean to say that"? No, they actually um, were wonderful. But I, I will say uh, that they've been pushing very hard um, and want to see results. <laughs> so they really need to work hard on this. You know, they would like to see us hiring quite a few people to make this happen. Um, you know, it's not that much money. So there's, you know, it's uh, it's great, and we've done work to do to try to figure out how to put it all together. That's for sure. And so the last thing I want to say was, um, uh, if you Google and then, it's worth Googling and reading this paper, Accountable Care and Safety Net. Uh, this was prepared for California. Another, okay, so um, there's um, a key, the last few minutes I keep talking about what California's been doing. The health foundations have been funding all these cool uh, efforts to, so, to, um, to help prepare for health care reform in a way that hasn't been happening in the state of Washington yet. And this is... This was one of those um, projects that was funded. And so um, that's all I have to say in terms of, um, and we've gone right up to near the end time. I don't know if you want to take any more time for Q&A or comments. Yes. One of the things I was going to say is that this doesn't really address the health disparity question a lot. Um, it, it looks at, you know, some outcomes and efficiency. But some of the changes that I've seen with managed care committed to Washington State and the word accountable, many of things are predicated on the mainstream and on the more. Some of the um, assessments for some of these have never been more the cost cultures. Um, many, uh, you know, it doesn't take into account language access. Um, and when you look at as a diverse community as King County, there's somebody who serves people who speak over 40 different languages, how these things are going to fit with the population that we serve gives me some trepidation on where those things are going to fit together. Um, because I'm, I'm not sure the people in the room that are deciding what accountable means and which assessments are reliable, um, I'm not sure if they're taking into account the cross-cultural aspect of who's deciding, you know, who have these things been tested in and who for. Yeah, so, so yes, I, I totally agree with you. And I have a couple of things to say about it. Um, you, you didn't ask a question, so I don't know. Oh, no, that's just my comment. Yeah. That there's all these, I'm from a teeny tiny behavioral health yeah. organization, but there's all these wonderful people, from these much larger ones, and uh, putting my plug in for really, whoever is in the room really thinking about the communities in which we serve, and not just the mainstream tool, because People aren't testing it. They aren't looking at how these work with other populations. They're still going on that, you know, kind of group health model of it works for those that we serve, but not necessarily for, you know, new arrivals or foreign-born or people who have other concepts of health or other concepts of mental health. 
And that's really a growing and emerging population in our town. Yeah. I mean, I work with um, one of the largest children's providers in California, and they hired this really um, smart researcher from the University of California, San Francisco, who, uh, who deconstructed um, the population that this organization serves and crosswalked it to the evidence-based practices. And it was really interesting because it, when you took diagnosis, 60% uh, of the kids that they were serving had uh, an EBP that would work for them. But then when you added in um, age and culture, that never dropped down to 18%. Where, 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 the, where the research said for this, this, this smaller cohort, is there an EBP for this, in 82% of the, an EBP that's been tested for this population, 82% of the time the answer was no. And so what they're doing is they're deconstructing, the next thing you did was rather than just like say forget EBPs, which you were talking about substances, I'm talking about practices, they, um, they deconstructed all the interventions that are in all the EBPs that they, that they have on the big menu. And it's interesting because if you create a, the evidence-based practice and then the intervention, there's many EBPs that use the same intervention. Yeah. And, with, and so what they're doing is they're basically training their clinicians to be much more intervention, focused on the, customizing the care plan for each child and look, thinking about whether there's an EBP that really works for this kid uh, based on those are those parts, the, the diagnosis and culture and age is still pretty uh, leaves a lot to be desired. So you also need to think about the child and the family, and then focus on inter putting together interventions and then measuring using a treat to target model that's come out of uh, University of Washington that I didn't have time to talk about, and and really measuring setting targets for each child, measuring whether it's working and if not changing the interventions and so your point and the, you know what what Jurgen has been talking about with this payment model is, is using treat to target in this in in the community folks so that you assess each individual as they come in and you work with them to identify um, one individual goal and then one uh, measurable clinical improvement goal and that's, that's not a vanilla assessment. That's looking at saying, I want to get a job and I want to deal with my major depression. And using, um, and also looking at the health goals. And I also have um, high cholesterol and I want to deal with that. And then measuring it. And, uh, and that's the kind of customization that I think is, that really needs to happen based on what you're talking about. It's, it's, it goes, it goes beyond culture, it goes beyond age group, it goes down to the individual level, taking into account uh, people's culture and all the other variables. I see your point is very well taken from my perspective. I think that I'm just going to say, some of us have the new futures company, we're talking about where Dr. Jackson from Harborview gave a presentation on how um, if you're targeting um, who you're going to be targeting, if you're looking at who you're going to be targeting, if you move away from many of the Office of Minority Health categories, and like Harvard now is collecting granular data, and you break that down even further, your targets are so much stronger. Your prevention outcomes are so much better. Mm -hmm. um, so who you collect data on and how you look at that data really makes a difference too. And so that was just a very powerful presentation by Dr. Jackson yeah. at Harvard. Okay, I think we're, we've run out of time, so I want to thank uh, Dale for a very informative uh, speech. Also, I'd like to thank Holly Rothman, who's back here, who managed all this live meeting technology. Uh, for those who are listening remotely, um, this will be taped, and I don't know how that will work, but we'll send out information to you about how you can access this. In case you didn't get it all the first time, you can actually watch it again. And there are a number of people who wanted to see it who weren't able to be here today. Um, we will be following up with our organizing group. Um, please contact me or Janet if you have any questions about whether you want to get involved in more of the planning. Please let us know. And again, thank you all for coming here and joining us remotely. Thank you. Good day, everybody. Good luck. <laughs>